From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Regular meetings of heads of state and government from around the globe have often convened facile minds to solve some of our most pressing problems. 76 years ago, the Yalta Conference helped reestablish Europe after World War II, made indelible by that three shot of Roosevelt, Stalin and Churchill. In my day at the White House 28 years ago, the three shot of Clinton, Rabin and Arafat to sign the Oslo Accords signaled in all of our hope at the time, the burgeoning of peace in the Middle East. Another such turning point conference is taking place this month in Glasgow, Scotland. The meeting, officially the 26th conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, but everyone is just calling it COP26. Quote, government negotiations continue, the Wall Street Journal reported yesterday as we record this, yet the real game changer has arguably been corporate muscle, the journal said. And Exhibit A, they say, is the $130 trillion, with a T, in private capital for the energy transition by the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, a group of 450 financial institutions from 45 countries. Listening to any of the speeches, a central theme of this year's conference was how inextricably connected the worlds of finance and sustainability have become. Finance dictates how people, companies, organizations, and governments put their assets to work. And it stands to reason that making sure that adding environmental considerations into that process for both the public and private sectors will lead to a more sustainable future. The photograph that immortalizes COP26 in history's annals is yet to be determined, but the data point may be that one number, 130 trillion. That and perhaps David Attenborough's riveting address to world leaders and the constant presence of the younger generation arguing for still more action. Our guest today has held multiple titles over the course of his career, has set the tone for some of the world's leading economies. He's reimagined the way that economics and finance should consider sustainability. Mark Carney is a public servant, climate finance reformer, an investor, an economist, and a well known advocate for sustainability. Our conversation with Mark Carney is coming up right after this. The transition to electronic trading is gaining support in fixed income markets, presenting opportunity and driving demand for data. At ICE, we're a leading provider for fixed income data and analytics. We offer a comprehensive fixed income execution solution via ICE Bonds, committed to execution quality, transparency, and information. We provide a wide range of platforms with deep liquidity pools that support multiple trading protocols. Our fixed income indices can be tailored to your investment strategy, powered by our data. Our ESG data offers increased transparency into fixed income markets. Access the ICE fixed income ecosystem, including the ICE bonds execution platforms, evaluated pricing and analytics via ICE fixed income select. By creating a single point of access for our execution platforms, customers can utilize a variety of trading protocols and manage risk. ICE supports your end-to-end fixed income workflow, increasing transparency, execution efficiency, and data access across the fixed income marketplace. Our guest today, Mark Carney, is now the UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance. He's had a distinguished career serving, among other roles, as the Governor of the Bank of Canada and then the Governor of the Bank of England. And prior to his public service, Mark spent 13 years at Goldman Sachs, that's our NYSE ticker symbol GS, deeply engaged in a host of global issues. Today, he serves as Vice Chairman and Head of Transition Investing at Brookfield Asset Management. Welcome, Mark, inside the Ice House. Josh, thanks very much for having me. It's great to be here. 
130 trillion in finance commitments from banks and asset managers across the world that's going to be used to finance net zero targets in their investments by 2050. They represent about 40% of the world's financial assets and now belong to this Glasgow Alliance for Net Zero. We're going to call it GFANS. Can you talk a little bit more about what it all means? Yeah, I'll talk about that. And, you know, it's the core of the system getting to a place where ICE and, you know, in many respects, NYSE was a while back. And I'll just give a bit of context because sometimes when things change dramatically, it's helpful to step back and say just how much it's moved. Started 2020, about 20% of the world emissions were covered by net zero commitments of countries. So people had signed, you know, back in COP21 in Paris, all these agreements were made, another photo moment from your introduction. But countries hadn't really mapped them into the path that they needed to follow in order to get to the overall objective of one and a half degrees. So UK takes up the presidency, 20% of the world's emissions are covered by net zero objectives of countries. Today, as we're talking, it's 90% plus. So you've seen a huge shift in countries saying, okay, here's our pathway. And here's some of the policies to get there. And what that's meant is that our conversation with financial institutions, whether they're banks, pension funds, asset managers, et cetera, around the world, has become relatively straightforward to say, well, look, if the country, if the world's moving to net zero on this transition path, what's your plan for the transition? Who are you financing? How do you look at the companies you lend to or invest in? Do they have a plan? And how can you make sure the capital's there in order to support them? That movement or that alliance has really gathered momentum since it was unveiled at President Biden's climate summit back in April. It was 70 trillion then. And we were conscious of a couple of things. One, we wanted to have the whole waterfront of finance in. So not just asset managers, we needed to have banks, asset owners, export credit agencies, et cetera, market infrastructure. And then secondly, it needed to be big enough to finance the overall climate transition. And, you know, Josh, as you know, there's various estimates of how much it's going to cost for the world to get from where we are today to where we need to go. But they tend to center around 100 trillion U.S. dollars, 100, 125 trillion U.S. dollars. So that 130 number allows us to say, look, the money's there. If, and this is the big if, if countries and companies want it, you and I both know, and listeners all know, you know, finance is an, an enabler. It helps companies and countries do what they want to do, but it's the initiative and the innovation and the drive of those companies that really makes it happen. An integral part of GFANS's objectives is mobilizing private capital into these emerging markets in developing countries through private-public partnerships. Why is supporting the development of ambitious country platforms that accelerate climate action critical to help keep the world's temperature from rising more? We in the world are in a position where the advanced economies, shorthand the G7, we've made most of the contribution to climate change through historic emissions. Most of our carbon is still up there in the atmosphere, but on a forward basis, it's the big emitters are in the emerging and developing world. Think China, India, Brazil, others. Those countries are going to need an additional about a trillion dollars a year of capital to have their transitions to both be able to grow and get emissions down while they grow. Now, a trillion a year for 30 years extra, that's that's doable. But of course, uh, longtime investors in the emerging and developing world know there's some additional risks in doing that. And for some of those countries, we need to blend private capital with some loss bearing, potentially loss bearing public capital. And by the way, having that public capital, whether it comes from the World Bank or, or some government, it makes it less likely that you know a government's going to change a regulation or expropriate an asset or do other things that sometimes happen. So what we're looking to do, and the members of GFANS put this money on the table and said, listen, we'll fund that extra trillion. We've got the resources, but we need a new approach in order to do it. Some of it will have loss bearing additional first loss. But actually, Josh, there's another big element to this, which is that Big asset managers, big banks now need to find assets, projects, companies that are on this path towards net zero. And they need to know in emerging and developing economies that that, that is indeed the case, whether it's in Brazil or India and others. And actually, the official sector can help stamp or validate that those projects are consistent with the transition the world needs to see. So it's not all about blended finance, but blended finance is a big component. Talking, Mark, about the private sector members of GFANS on the greenhouse gas reduction front, we're seeing companies assessing their own emissions footprint, setting targets for reductions, implementing them 
what are the best set of incentives to encourage those companies to go through this process accurately and build and implement it as a part of their own business strategy? You were meeting with a bunch of them in New York and I'm sure in Scotland as well. One is if, if we go at the highest level, the country level, there's a set of incentives that come from regulation, carbon pricing, just the direction of travel of government policy that's necessary to, you know, you're, you're coming to me from the U.S., U.S. is targeting 50% down by 2030. I'm in the U.K. They're targeting 65% down by 2030. So there's a series of policies that go with that. Ultimately, policies that are really going to drive innovation in the private sector, much of which will come out of the U.S. So first, there's government policies. The second is actual simple disclosure. We have not had a consistent way of disclosing around climate risk, but also uh, even things as basic as the emissions of a company their own emissions, the emission of the power they use, and the emissions of those up and down the supply chain. And what the dynamic that's now set up, Josh, is that most capital allocation decisions, whether it's a lender or, or an investor, they're increasingly going to be looking at these questions. What's your emissions footprint today? Where is it going tomorrow? Is my capital helping to get it down? If it is, great, because then I will get credit for that and you're going to create value because there's this convergence. So our objective for Glasgow was, was really twofold. One was to have the plumbing of the markets reorganized so that you know investors and lenders had the information and the tools, tools like stress testing, capital value at risk, portfolio alignment techniques, various tools and some new markets, markets like markets for carbon offsets. And I know ICE is involved in helping to develop that. And that's hugely important. So all of those elements are there so that the brains of finance and those with the capital can make these allocation decisions, get capital behind solutions, and quite candidly, create a lot of value. This is moving beyond the risk management, which is obviously essential with, with climate, but it's moving to the value creation that comes with getting emissions down. Watching some of the news over the last couple of weeks from Europe, it seems like the reception that you've received from CEOs has been very positive. But then I keep reading you know, about meetings in other parts of the world, Mark. Steve Schwartzman is in Saudi Arabia saying things like, if you try and raise money to drill holes, it's impossible to get that money. And Larry Fink, always a friend of ESG issues these days, at the same conference saying, we have these visions that we could go from a brown world and we could wake up tomorrow and it'd be a green world. That's not going to happen. Are they right or are they trying to appease their local audience? Look, it'd be nice if we could flip a green switch and be in this sustainable world overnight. Obviously, we can't. Still, 80% plus of global energy is provided by fossil fuels. A lot of that's coal. A lot of it's very high emitting. And that's part of the reason why we need the 100 trillion of investment in order to get from where we are today to where we need to go tomorrow. We're not going to get there without a plan and a relentless focus on getting emissions down. So there's a couple of implications of that. One is the scale of investment in low carbon, low emitting activities. And you know it gets a lot of focus in the energy sector, but it's as much about helping steel companies, cement companies get their emissions down, you know, those transportation sector, other things like that. So we need to have that focus at the same time. Well, we have far too many fossil fuels, proven fossil fuel reserves in the ground. So in other words, if we burn them all, we would not achieve our climate objectives. It's clear we don't have the all the fossil fuels in the right place today. You see what's going on in Europe and gas. I'm in the UK at the moment, what's going on in this market. So there is some element, and it's some element, of support for those industries during this transition, but it has to be a transition. And part and parcel of that is the cost of capital relative to the future, you know, of the future is low relative to the past and to some extent the present, which is relatively high. And that, that is the way it's going to be. And so if I bring all of that together, Steve is right and Larry is right in the sense of, yeah, it's hard to get capital for this. And yeah, it's more expensive in these areas. That is consistent with the direction the world's headed. Now, one other thing, if I may, which is, and Larry actually, of BlackRock, very much part of G fans, and Larry and Jane Fraser of Citigroup and Oliver Bott from Allianz, are leading work to figure out how to finance so-called stranded assets. And I, when I say stranded assets, I mean assets that, you know, if we're gonna be on the climate path, those assets aren't gonna to last to the end of their 
full economic life, their old economic life, because we want to keep those in the sector with responsible owners who are transparently, you know, running them for a while and then ultimately tailing them off consistent with the transition. So big issues around the energy transition. If we are going to make the transition, there's just going to be less and less capital for the old economy. You say tomato, I say tomato. Sometimes Canadians and Americans can pronounce some words differently, but essentially we speak the same language and a lot of issues we are very much aligned and we look at things the same way. You and Chancellor Rishi Sunak also convened an international partnership to welcome the IFRS Foundation's plans for global climate reporting standards. So whatever the language is, why is having a common reporting language critical for achieving net zero? Critical, critical question. And a tomato and a tomato taste the same. They're pronounced differently. I think in financial disclosure, we all know that basically IASB standards, which is under the IFRS, which most of the world uses, effectively gets to the same disclosure, a very similar disclosure as FASB disclosure in the United States, right? They are different disclosure regimes, but they're broadly showing the same picture. In sustainability, we need a standard for sustainability. We have an alphabet soup of very well-meaning proposals out there, the most important of which is something called the TCFD, which was only launched as a concept six years ago at Paris, actually, and only first version rolled out three years ago. The world's coalescing around the TCFD. And so there's two pathways for that. One, in the U.S., governed by the SEC, and they're currently consulting on, on that approach, and you know we'll see what comes in the fullness of time there. And then internationally, anchored in this new body, the ISSB, so the International Sustainability Standards Board, who will produce their first version of this disclosure standard the middle of next year. Now, you and I are plumbers, and a lot of people who listen to this are plumbers, and that's overnight. I mean, that's like you call the plumber and the guys at your door before you hang up the phone and they've fixed your fixed your leak. And the reason they can do that is they're taking all of the existing work and many of the existing people and they're bringing them in, they're merging and they're having them work on it because it's that important. Now, the so what to that is just under 40 countries, I think it's 38 countries supported this at Glasgow. The chancellor and I were, were there for that. And that's 70 percent of global emissions. So you have the U.S. going down this track. I, I don't want to presume what comes out of the SEC process, but you know, there's an executive order from the president and a, a focus of FSOC on it. So they're likely to end up with something like this. And then internationally, a very similar approach. And lo and behold, we're going to have a pretty common standard, some local differences, obviously, as appropriate, pretty common standard globally for climate-related risks, including forward-looking. And those listening and the institutions they represent who are increasingly thinking about allocating capital around this are going to have some common information on a global basis. Let's turn to some of the real plumbing in the markets themselves. And we mentioned some of ICE's work in this area. You did, thank you. ICE futures markets are one of the mechanisms for pricing carbon through EUA and UKA futures contracts. But there's a well-known chart that the World Bank maintains that shows all of the different pricing regimes across more than 60 countries. What would get us to a world that prices carbon efficiently everywhere and across borders. You solve a problem by recognizing you have a problem, getting increasing consensus around the solution. So slightly different calculations of this, but let's say we're no more than 30% of global emissions covered by some form of pricing regime. And as you just said, Josh, they vary, they vary in their coverage, the mechanisms that's there, pretty wide range of the actual prices. And in virtually every case, the price is is quite low relative to the opportunity cost of carbon. So there has been an effort that's come through the G20 and it really only gathered momentum this year to say, listen, can we have a global move towards a similar pricing regime with obviously local differences? In COP, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, was making this point, Canada has quite a comprehensive regime. The carbon price is going up to $170 Canadian, but still a big number by 2030. And that's in legislation. Trudeau is pushing that we get to two thirds of the world's emissions covered by a carbon price through a compliance regime dealing with mitigation. One doesn't feel a lot of momentum in the U.S. on this, although if there's a market built or an economy built for a carbon price, it's the U.S. and that no market's better than anyone else and more innovative as an economy than anyone else. And of course, that's the benefit of a carbon price. It helps drive innovation. Look, if you have a financial sector that's forward looking, which is what we have now with this 130 trillion, 
something like a forward carbon price. It doesn't have to be the price today. The forward carbon price, the market pulls forward the adjustment and smooths the adjustment, gets the innovation and investment in place so that when you get to 2025 or 2030, the economy is ready for it. And actually we've created a lot of jobs and you know we're more efficient as a consequence. So it's not gonna surprise you, I'm a big believer in this, but there's another market which is important. So just so listeners are following, there's the compliance market, we're trying to get emissions down. There's also a market for so-called carbon offsets and carbon credits. And you know, to be blunt, that market has not had the standards of integrity and, and compliance and professionalism that's needed. And, you know, ICE knows this better than anybody. If you don't have those standards, well, the market doesn't take off. And so the market for all the headlines it has today is only about a billion dollars a year. It's nothing effectively, but that's a hundred to 150 billion a year market properly designed. And you know this, but a number of organizations over 250 organizations, market participants, NGOs, emitters, and providers of offsets have come up with the approach for that new market, new governance structure, new terms, new carbon principles. And we have the prospect in the next year of a voluntary carbon market really scaling for offsets. Again, why does that matter? Well, it matters for two reasons. Ultimately, it matters because these offsets actually expand our carbon budget. It gives us more room to get to where we need to go to. And secondly, it matters on an individual company basis because Companies are looking to get their emissions down. That's their first, you know, absolute emissions down. But in some countries, they're expected to compensate for the emissions they have. And the only way they can compensate for them is through these offsets. So it's it's a big piece of the puzzle. My personal view is that it will really gain traction because the hard work has been done to get it to a level of professionalism that's uh, and high integrity that's needed. You mentioned the G20 earlier. It didn't meet last year. It met this year in Rome just before COP26 began. Talk about these family photo shots, Mark. There's all of them standing in front of the Trevi Fountain, throwing a coin in and making a wish and probably wishing, you know, that we could suddenly go green. But and you mentioned like all the work that Prime Minister Trudeau is doing. His neighbor to the south, President Biden, has vowed to double annual aid to developing nations to address climate change to $11.4 billion per year. But Mohamed Adao, the director of Power Shift Africa, says, I'm going to quote him here, the U.S. is still woefully short of what it owes. Is he right? This is one of the thorniest issues at COP. There was a commitment made 10 years ago, 11 years ago in Copenhagen, that the advanced economies would send $100 billion a year effectively, I mean, through various mechanisms, including the World Bank and others, to the most vulnerable countries in the world to help with this transition for climate change and help with the impact of climate change. It's as much about adapting to the extreme weather. And, you know, uh, advanced economies as a whole, not just the United States, have come up short. This week in COP, what came across was a plan anchored in the US, UK, Canada, others stepped up for more and basically over a five-year period, it averages $100 billion a year. It, it scales up by 2023. And that's been met with a degree of acceptance, shall we say. I wouldn't say widespread enthusiasm, but a degree of acceptance. What's critical for taxpayers around the world is that money has maximum impact. And Josh, you touched on part of it earlier, which is well, part of the way you have maximum impact is you make sure if there's a dollar of public money going in, it helps to catalyze multiple dollars of private money. What we know as well from last week in Glasgow is there are trillions of, of private money. You know, there, it's interesting the focus on the hundred billion. Well, we showed up with more than a hundred trillion, a thousand times more than that, and it just underscores. Look, the public sector's got to play a role, but the private sector is going to decide whether or not we we get to where we need to go. You and I were originally scheduled to talk right before the conference opened to do a scene setter. You know, in many ways, I think it's better for our listeners to hear your postmortem. So I'm glad we're talking now. But as we were counting down the days, your hours were getting short, Mark. And I've listened to a lot of your interviews. I've read a lot of your history. I know that it's not hard for you to run out the door and squeeze in a, a quick 10 mile run just to clear your head. But I'm curious if you just want to bring us into your office and your thinking in those final five days counting down and then how it transpired for you and whether you sort of maintain the right equilibrium and managed to hold it all together as, as everyone convened. 
Yeah, I would like to think I held, <laughs> held it together. But, you know, there's a lot of constituencies in COP. When they say the parties, they mean the parties with, you know, multiple S's at the end. And I think you nailed it at the start, Josh, when you were saying just the importance of the private sector in this COP and how it stepped up in the financial sector. But that's a hugely complex, diverse global group, and all of whom deserve attention when they're making big decisions about whether or not to make these commitments. We had a lot of momentum coming right into Glasgow as we hoped we would, but it meant a lot of conversations sort of 24-7 with institutions around the world. Then on top of that, you're getting the theater, if you will, of the G20 and translating some momentum out of Rome into backing the IISSB, the, the various other plumbing type issues that come with it. And then on top of that, you get the layer in real time of civil society that's there that is skeptical of all of this and part of their role to be skeptical of it and engage on that. And so if you're asking about whether I got a run in, I did get runs in in the park by Glasgow University, which was a nice balance. I mean, the world watched you closely, Mark, at your time in Ottawa and then in London, but now you are really very much in a different role, but really entering the world stage and going to stay there as this issue is only going to get hotter, as it were. So let's switch gears a little bit just so our listeners understand, you know, the person putting together this $130 trillion deal and working with all these both private sector and, and world leaders. Initially, you wanted to study marine biology, but you ended up studying economics at a school across the dirty water of the Charles River from my hometown in Boston. Both of those disciplines, Mark, I suppose, are central to climate change conversations. But who inspired you more as a kid, Jacques Cousteau or John Maynard Keynes? That's a fantastic question. That's great research as well. I did watch the Calypso. You're right. And, you know, look, I grew up in the prairie, so it was kind of unlikely I was going to be a marine biologist and ended up more likely to be an economist. So, yeah, definitely more inspired by Cousteau. But then as I got older and, you know, thought about the world and how the world works, I wanted to understand how the world works. And then, of course, you know, how you can make the world better and you can make it better through finance and economics. I mean, those are some of the greatest levers. You can make it a lot worse through those as well. Of course, things always look clearer in retrospect than they are at the time. But really at this intersection of the private sector and public sector throughout when, when I was at Goldman, I did a lot you know, with countries. And then obviously in the public sector, I've tended to work to help ensure that markets are providing the solutions that people want. Sometimes that's big numbers, but a lot of time, again, as you guys know, it's about getting the plumbing and the infrastructure right and aligning incentives. So a lot of smart people and some dumb ones too, but a lot of smart people can make a series of decisions, make a market and move us forward. That little place on the prairie mark, Fort Smith, town of 2,500 people at its best, in the Northwest Territories of Canada. I looked on the map sandwiched between Lake Athabasca and the Great Slave Lake. The motto of the town, perseverance, appropriate for a region where York boats needed portages to allow the Hudson's Bay Company to bypass all of those rapids. What were the portages you needed to get from that place in the prairie, the Slave River Valley to the Charles River Basin? Look, I was very fortunate, I guess, in a couple of respects. One, I had parents who cared a lot about education. They were teachers. So that was kind of in the in the blood. I was lucky that I was a good enough hockey player, that I was of mild interest to uh, the Crimson, but not good enough to actually spend much time playing hockey when I was there. No so. bean pot tournament for you? I was a goalie. I was a backup goalie. So I opened the gate for a lot of very talented hockey players, including a guy who ended up winning the Stanley Cup as GM of the Bruins, Pete Chiarelli, my roommate. So, and of course, in a place that also looks for diversity in their student body. So anyways, I was lucky to go there. I'd be hard pressed to say I didn't come from you know privilege, but I'd be hard pressed to say that I had these insurmountable rapids that I had to get around to uh, to get to where I went. Mark, those years at Goldman during the Bob Rubin and Hank Paulson eras, both future secretaries of the Treasury, what did you learn from them at the firm and what have you carried with them into some of your other roles? Well, I think there's a couple of things I learned at Goldman. And one was, and it made an impression of me very early on, I was an analyst. I needed to get a hold of Bob Rubin for something. It was an issue around credit. You know, he doesn't know me and, you know, lob a call in and he's back in, uh, you know, within a few hours, he gets back to me. And it was true of virtually everybody. You'd get a you know, there, there was a sense of responsibility. You're part of something bigger. You always reciprocated, or at least that was my experience. So that sense of teamwork was very strong. With Hank, who I worked a little more closely with, had more a little more interaction. I, mean, I know Bob now better than I did then. I mean, Hank is, he's relentless. 
you know, he's focused, he understands the purpose. He's, he's, he was always very client focused. So outcome focused and absolutely relentless and ambitious, ambitious for his clients. Um, obviously he was ambitious when he was treasury secretary. He's ambitious now with what he's doing on the investing side with TPG. That teaches you a lesson. I, and if I can bring it into the climate space, when we sat down, start of 2020 and said, well, what do we want to accomplish for Glasgow? We thought, well, we want to have a system where climate change is one of the determinants of value, just like credit is and technology. And what do we need to do that? So have a big goal, work on the on the plumbing of that and, and, and try to galvanize people towards it. And of course, you can only do that with a team and you can only do that by maintaining a focus. And I think both of those elements I took from uh, from those individuals. Mark, the New York Stock Exchange recently announced a partnership with the Intrinsic Exchange Group, the goal really to create a new type of investment that they call natural asset companies or NACs, which can help price the maintenance of certain natural ecosystems. Can you give us your thoughts on how natural capital is or could be or should be valued? Let me give one other thing in terms of the context of Glasgow, and I'll answer that, which is that we've been on this journey since Paris that's taken a, a bit longer than it should have, but to get to this focus on net zero transition, one and a half degrees, and the hard numbers of finance that we can all understand, and now the system's going to go optimize it, uh, towards that. But in parallel, you got to think about nature and biodiversity, and you also have to think about, obviously, communities and the nature of the transition. So net zero and the transition, these are hard numbers. It's what are your emissions? Are they going down? If they're going down by how much, et cetera. It is more challenging to value nature, natural capital and assets. Now, part of that can be valued through those carbon offset markets that we were talking about earlier. A lot of it's around reforestation and biodiversity. So there's some value there. Part of it can be valued, and this is work that Hank and his institute have done around what are called ecosystem services. So what's the value of the, you think about bees and pollinators and their value for crops, and you can estimate those values. How you crystallize and capitalize that value is another question, which part of what the NACs I think do. In the end, part of what nature has to be valued on is on its own terms. There's value of nature for reducing carbon. There's value of nature in agriculture and other economic processes, and, and we capitalize. And then there's value of nature, which is the quest value, effectively. You know, we, we grow up with nature, we experience it. And if we don't pass it on, then we've undercut future generations. Now, how you price that is a challenge. You're never going to be able to fully price it and fully realize it. Vehicles that look at that more closely, track nature on its own terms, can help impute some value and some price. And what I would say, again, just going back to the direction of travel, look, we have run down on various estimates our natural capital by about 40% over the course of the last three, three decades or so. Well, we built up a lot of physical capital and a bit of human capital, and we got to turn that around. And so this general idea for those who haven't followed maybe quite as closely of you know, net zero and nature positive. So moving to a world where we're moving to net zero, but we're actually adding back to nature, adding back to biodiversity. And there will be value around it. The only point I'd make is it's hard for it to be fully valued, but that's true of many things in life that, you know, you don't crystallize the, uh, you know, everything in, in a monetary value. Talking about value, Mark, one of the things that you worked on during your transition from public servant to Bank of England to the private sector, Brookfield Asset Management, and your role with the UN was to write this book, Values, Building a Better World for All. The manuscript came in at about 608 pages, examining the challenges that exist and the need for radical change to fix it. What spurred you to sit in front of your computer and, and work on 608 pages when you could have been doing other things? And what did you learn from that process? Part of what spurred me, Josh, was you know my time as a governor was in many respects a series of crises. I started in the financial crisis. I ended with the, at the start of the COVID crisis. In between, I had the euro crisis, Brexit, which in some respects a crisis, and this sort of building climate crisis. And so I was asking myself the question of, okay, well, what is there a common element to this? And if so, what are they in common lessons for how to address it as a leader of an organization or as an investor or indeed as a policymaker as a country? So that was the task I set myself. And what I learned around it, one of the core elements I, I picked up was uh, really crystallized is this point that as a society, if we really value something, you know, instead of trading it off, if we get to the point where 
you know, health is valued and we're going to organize ourselves to sort of COVID, which is what the U.S. and others did from a medical perspective in terms of the vaccines and others. The market just drives, helps drive that solution. What we've got to finally, I think, as a point on climate is this broad consensus. It's not absolutely everybody, but broad consensus and understanding we need to get to net zero. Well, once you decide that, once we decide that and we recognize that this is addressing what's an enormous, if not existential risk, then whatever is a solution to that creates a lot of value. So it's the values of society, what we care about, could be biodiversity, nature, could be climate, could be greater equality. And then the value in the market is determined in that. In many respects, that's the playbook we've been applying you know, for Glasgow, which is that given this task of getting to net zero, well, how do we organize the market so that it's part of the solution? And candidly, and, you know, I'm, I'm upfront about this, that it turns this risk into an enormous commercial opportunity. And that's what's necessary. That's what's necessary to move forward. And, and you're already seeing a lot of people moving on that opportunity. And, and that's what gives me, uh, gives me optimism. We're going to get to where we need to go. On the topic of commercial opportunities, Mark, you've said that Peter Weir's Gallipoli is your favorite film and his 1982 follow-up to that, The Year of Living Dangerously, is one of mine. But Weir's least commercial success came four years later with The Mosquito Coast, which is oddly prescient as Harrison Ford's Ali Fox goes off the grid in a South American rainforest in an effort to rebuild civilization that he thinks is heading off the industrialized and consumerized precipice. At the end of the day, seeing what you saw in Glasgow and COP26, are you hopeful that we can step back from the cliff that Ali Fox feared? How do we do that? If we weren't taking this seriously, if we didn't have the best minds now in finance and in business focused on this, I'd be very worried. We've left this very late. I I may be sounding more optimistic. Uh, One of the things that continues to hit me is that the science on climate change and the extreme weather events they're actually moving against us. In other words, we used to think that three degrees, I mean, 25 years ago wasn't great, but it was fine. Now we're realizing actually there's a big difference between one and a half and two degrees, even though we're coming very close to one and a half. And so that gives me pause and concern. What gives me more optimism is just the breadth of people who are now focusing on it. By the way, Harrison Ford, cares a lot about this issue, as you know, and has helped put it on the map. But yeah, we need more than the Raiders of the Lost Ark version of Harrison Ford in order to get where we need to go. Another person who cares a lot about this issue is Pope Francis, Mark. You had lunch with him and he turned to you and said, using an extended metaphor where wine symbolized humanity and grappa symbolized the market for self-interest. He said, your job is to turn the grappa into wine and turn the market back into humanity. You did that in Glasgow, and I'm sure you're going to be doing it in the months and years ahead, both in the public sector in your UN role and at Brookfield Asset Management. Thanks so much for taking out a little time to tell us how COP26 went and spending some time with us inside the Ice House. We're fantastic. I really enjoyed it, Josh. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England and the UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Veronica Slumka, Brooklyn McLaughlin, Brian Matt, and production assistance from Stefan Capriel, Pete Ash, and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. We will talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 